Kokainum. The worst actors of all time. Or how about during the 1980s? Cause not every dog has his day, and some of our favorite actors actually put up some terrible work too. God awful accents, raunchy scenes that had no place in the film, or yuck, musicians arrogantly looking to make a few extra bucks at the box office. It's hard to define good acting, but I think it's instantly recognizable when an actor is terrible. Bring the toy back, bring the toy back to the carpet, bring it back to the carpet. You can't take your eyes away. And while some actors specialize in being bad, there are some actual superstars on this list that did some terrible acting jobs in the 1980s. Welcome, I am Nostalgic Nick, and we're taking a look at 20 of the worst acting performances from the 1980s. From inarticulate boxers to massive stars having an off 10 years or so. Okay, man, okay. And from all of us at Do You Remember, we want to thank you for watching as our team spends a lot of time researching topics, writing scripts, voicing said scripts, and then editing all that together into a final product which we certainly hope you enjoy. If you enjoy our list, please click that thumbs up icon, it really helps. Subscribe to our channel so you never miss a memory. But now, grab your popcorn and get comfortable, because sometimes it's fun to be bad. We ain't seen bad yet, but it's coming. Arnold Schwarzenegger. My nipples are very sensitive. All right, so I gotta say, just because an actor is on this list, it doesn't mean they are inherently bad or only produce garbage performances. But sometimes, even the Terminator misses his mark. And unlike some others on this list, Arnold wasn't only in bad movies in the 1980s. Nope, Arnie starred in some of the biggest movies of the decade that were beloved by both critics and the public. But it doesn't change the fact that Arnold Schwarzenegger simply cannot act very well. I am tired of the same old phases, the same old things. Simply put, there's nothing below the surface happening with the Austrian Adonis. No true emotion conveyed other than wide eyes, snarled lips, and screaming. <laughs> And sometimes that works. I mean, he was fantastic in The Terminator, where he basically was a robot who just had to look very intimidating. But other than that, he was successful because the man has more charisma in his left pinky than anyone else in their whole body. But I do think what he does on screen isn't described as acting, but rather just being Arnold Schwarzenegger on screen. And yeah, there are films that'll work. The Terminator, Total Recall, but for the most part, Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of the worst actors from the 1980s. No chance. Ali Sheedy, a tale as old as time, an actor who failed to reach the heights of their previous success, which was pretty huge with The Breakfast Club. But Ali Sheedy is a cautionary tale of good material equals good actress. Because when given a script that isn't total crap, Ali Sheedy really shines. And if you don't believe me, go watch War Games right now. But the flip side of that, unfortunately, is that Sheedy is unable to manufacture a good performance when given nothing but crappy lines to say. Input, that's information. She was simply just not good, starring opposite Judd Nelson in Blue City, and even worse in Heart of Dixie, a 1989 film about three white sorority sisters on an Alabama college campus. We get to watch as they come to grips with integration. Yikes. So, despite reaching some undeniable acting highs during the 1980s, Ali Sheedy's lows land her firmly on this list. Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Mommy, I don't wanna be changed. I know, I know. The 1970s showcased a hit maker named The Italian Stallion. Sly gave a universally acclaimed and Oscar-nominated performance in 1977's Rocky. But then, everything kinda went off the rails. A combination of poor project choices and Stallone apparently forgetting he wasn't permanently in Rocky. You know, mumbling through all his lines as if he had spent the last several decades being repeatedly punched in the face. Good disease. I'm the cure. Well, all that combined to turn out some terrible performances. 
Now, the Golden Raspberry Awards are not the be-all end-all for worst acting, but the man absolutely cleaned up during the decade winning the mock Oscar four times for Rhinestone, Rambo First Blood, Rocky IV, and Rambo III, and being nominated a further four times. Seriously, Stallone won the Golden Raspberry for Worst Actor of the 1980s. So yeah, I kinda rest my case. Madonna. Hi there, Simon Lake overcommitted myself, you understand, huh? The track record for musical artists turned actors is a mixed bag at best. Will Smith, pretty good. Mark Wahlberg, kinda bad. What? No. And Madonna, hmm, up and down. But in the 1980s, just bad. Which is not 100% the queen of pop's fault. I mean, she was done no favors by the terrible scripts and worst direction of films like Shanghai Surprise and Bloodhounds of Broadway, yikes. But still, it's almost painful at times to watch such a powerfully magnetic star dry up and fizzle on screen. All the charisma stripped away as she awkwardly attempts to make sense of lines Meryl Streep would struggle to say with a straight face. Which is a shame, really, because anyone who has seen A League of Their Own knows that Madonna can actually act when given a chance. What am I supposed to do? Go back to taxi dancing? Ten cents or some slop can sweat gin all over me? Just, um, skip all of that 1980s junk. John Travolta. What I wanna do? What? You know what I wanna do? What? Strut. I know this is gonna cause some trouble, but for all you people up in arms about John Travolta being on this list, have you seen the 1980s films? Because this isn't a list from the 1970s or even the 90s. I mean, his performances in Grease or Pulp Fiction and Face Off are national treasures. But this list focuses solely on the decade in between, unfortunately, and woof. In such spectacular failures as Staying Alive, the most unnecessary sequel of all time, and two of a kind, Travolta almost seems to be doing a caricature of his younger anti-hero characters. Almost like he's completely forgotten how to act. He just watched Saturday Night Fever and thinks, yeah, I'll just do that again. Brooke Shields. It feels almost mean to pile on Brooke Shields' work in the early 80s, because she was definitely an exploited minor at the time. But hey, terrible acting is terrible acting. By the start of the decade, Shields was one of the most recognizable faces on the planet due to a very successful modeling career, and she was only 15. Then the precocious teenager decided to transition to acting, and things, well, didn't go well. Why don't you give up? You don't even know where San Francisco is! She began her career with The Blue Lagoon, which is kinda creepy, because it featured several nude scenes that involved minors. Then she followed that up with 1981's Endless Love, a movie that initially received an X rating and that Shields made when she was just 16. Provocative, but not good. And I'm including Shields' immature and depthless acting here. Her next project might be the most hilarious, because she was the only woman in history to win the Razzie for Worst Supporting Actor as Brooke Shields with a mustache from 1983's Sahara. Yeah, pretty harsh. Faye Dunaway. So yeah, Faye Dunaway gave some incredible performances in the 1970s. Her turns in Chinatown and Network were simply stunning, with a weight and gravitas that live on today. But then, the 1980s happened, and Dunaway was nominated for the Razzie for Worst Actress. In movies like The First Deadly Sin and The Wicked Lady, she appears to have lost all of her mojo. She just doesn't seem to be the same caliber actress she used to be. And then there was 1984's Supergirl, in which Dunaway plays the villain, and in a campy comedy, is forced to play the straight man to, um, not great results. Enjoy your prison, Supergirl. Maybe it was bad scripts. Maybe she was just phoning it in. But for whatever the reason, 1980's Dunaway left a lot to be desired. Michael Caine. Please don't throw the stones yet. 
Is it possible for someone to be both one of the best actors of a decade, while also simultaneously being one of the worst? Look at Michael Caine in the 1980s, and the answer, I think, is a definitive yes. I thought you understood that. I thought that was why you said well, that Well, could... we obviously do not understand each other. And I'll tell you a little anecdote to prove it. In 1986, Kane won his first Oscar for Hannah and Her Sisters, but he wasn't present at the ceremony to accept his award, as he was currently filming the travesty that was Jaws the Revenge, a film in which he was really bad in. Don't worry, the nightmares will go away. The problem with Michael Caine, if there was one, you see, is that he said yes to pretty much any project put in front of him. Because hey, money is really cool. But that just led to schlock like The Island and Blame It on Rio. Terrible films in which Kane is obviously putting forth minimal effort in order to grab a quick check. And therefore, yes, Michael Caine, the great Michael Caine makes this list. Brigitte Nielsen In a conundrum as old as the chicken and the egg, did Brigitte Nielsen become a terrible actor because she married Sylvester Stallone? Or did Sly marry Brigitte because she was a terrible actor? I suppose we'll never know for sure, but trust me, Nielsen kinda sucked. She first came to the screen as Red Sonja in 1985's Red Sonja, which was basically Girl Conan the Barbarian and 1,000 times worse. She then stank up such Stallone vehicles as Rocky IV and Cobra, before rounding out the decade starring in Bye Bye Baby, which while being one of the few films to feature five pin billiards on screen in any detail, a hilarious detail, it also sucked. And along with her divorce from the Italian Stallion, it all kind of effectively killed her mainstream movie career. Oh well. Burt Reynolds. Sometimes, like Icarus, you fly too close to the sun, and boom, suddenly you're plummeting back to Earth. Burt Reynolds was voted number one in the top 10 money-making stars poll, a device used to calculate bankability of movie stars, for a record four straight years, 1978 until 82. You know, on the back of massive hits like Smokey and the Bandit and Cannonball Run, but the magic just didn't really continue. And a series of flops and poor performances in films like City Heat, about which Reynolds said, quote, I was playing Jack Lemmon in this strange film where people were getting blown away. I never read a review of the film because I knew I was going to get killed by the critics. It all led to him eventually starring in Drivel, like 1988's Rent-A-Cop alongside Liza Minnelli, which is not a made-up fact. Rent-A-Cop is awful. What are you looking at? Nothing. Oh how the mighty have fallen. Linda Blair. Poor Linda Blair, the child who wowed and horrified audiences in The Exorcist, grew up to star in some of the worst exploitation horror films of that time. And boy, did she suck in them. Peter's dead. Or, well. <laughs> I mean, check out this string of films. 1981's Hell Night, about a fraternity hazing ritual gone wrong. 1983's Chained Heat, also starring Brigitte Nielsen. Then you got 1984's Savage Streets. Now that one follows a Los Angeles high school student who enacts revenge against a male gang after they brutalize her deaf, mute younger sister and murder her friend. I mean, yeah, all those films sound incredible and I don't know which to watch first. And let's be clear here, Blair was not giving fantastic performances in crappy movies. Her performances helped these bad movies sink to even lower depths, unfortunately. I'm sorry, Linda Blair. Judd Nelson Judd Nelson starred in some of the most iconic films of the 1980s, St. Elmo's Fire and The Breakfast Club. But does that make him a good actor? I'd argue that he is very charismatic as the bad boy outsider, but even in good films, Judd tends to be very one note acting wise. Sidebar, you want it? Sidebar, what for? Because I want a sidebar. And then there's the whole issue of the not good movies, specifically late 80s fare like From the Hip and Blue City. 
where Nelson is forced out of his comfort zone of amazing scripts and co-stars and is forced to carry a film on his own, which unfortunately he is unable to do. So for all you Judd heads out there, I recommend fixing John Bender in your mind's eye and forgetting everything that came after. Olivia Newton-John Another case of a successful singer turning to the silver screen. Olivia Newton-John's career started out incredibly promising, as her first role was Sandy in the smash hit Grease. Tell me about it, Stan. The sky's the limit, right? No, wrong. She only starred in two movies in the whole decade of the 80s, and both were absolute train wrecks that earned her a Razzie nomination. Well, at least she batted 1000%. The first was 1980's Xanadu, a fantasy musical that was far better suited to Broadway than the big screen. And the second was 1983's Two of a Kind, a movie that reunited her with John Travolta. Only this time, people flew out of the theaters like greased lightning to escape the awfulness on screen. You'd truly have to be hopelessly devoted to Newton John to put yourself through watching either of her dreadful 1980s films. Caitlyn Jenner. Caitlyn Jenner, you say, but she's not really an actress. We're talking about an Olympic champion and the second most famous reality TV mom in the world. Ah, but trust old Nikki Poo, because Jenner did in fact star in one film in the 1980s. And it was so hilariously bad that it directly inspired the entire institution of the Golden Raspberry Awards. That is, of course, 1980s Can't Stop the Music, a fictionalized account of the village people's lives that was released after disco had begun its death spiral. And it is just as bad as it sounds. God, thank you. Oh, Jenner plays an unhip St. Louis lawyer who is freaked out by the big city, but only the audience was ever freaked out by having to sit through this train wreck. Jenner ultimately lost in the inaugural Razzie for Best Actor to another singer, Neil Diamond in The Jazz Singer. Yep, that happened, but boy oh boy does Caitlyn Jenner suck at acting. Pia Zadora. Ah yes, Pia Zadora, that household name. You first saw her on the screen in the 1964 cult classic Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. We leave for Earth tonight. Pack your other mustache. But after that, Zadora's career had a um, bit of a lull. That is, until her Israeli billionaire husband, who was 30 years her senior, financed the film Butterfly in 1982. In Butterfly, she starred alongside Orson Welles in a tale of family intrigue, silver mining, and father-daughter yikes, yeah. Yep, that's right, Zadora was atrocious in the film because she wasn't an actress but somehow won the Golden Globe for New Star of the Year at the same time as winning the Razzie for Worst Actress. Go figure, she continued to star in such elevated fare as Voyage of the Rock Aliens and The Lonely Lady, the latter of which she also won a Razzie for. So yeah, not the most distinguished career ever. Bo Derek. Bo Derek burst onto the screen with 1978's Ten, a groundbreaking comedy that set the stage for the ridiculously beautiful Derek to kind of take over the world. But alas, that was not to happen. Her next two acting credits, both directed by her much older husband, were Tarzan the Ape Man, an awful retelling of the classic in which the acting is so bad people consider it one of the worst films of all time. I'm still a virgin. And Bolero, a movie that centers on the Derek's sensual awakening and her journey around the world to pursue an ideal first lover who will take her virginity. Surprise, surprise, that one really sucked too. Derek then finished off the decade with Ghosts Can't Do It, in which she tries to find the perfect murder victim so her dead husband's ghost can inhabit him and they can bang again. Seriously, truly one of the worst actors of the decade. Chevy Chase. Massive movie star, hilarious ex-SNL alum, and a massive piece of 
because as magnetic, charming, and funny as Chase can be on screen, no one in their right mind would describe him as being good at acting. He is pretty much just playing himself in every scene he's ever been in, with little to no range outside of that. And hey, that's not exactly a criticism, it has worked very well for him. The guy is fantastic in Caddyshack and National Lampoon's Vacation. You may think you hate it now, honey, but what are you driving? But Chase's style is much more performative and harkens back to an earlier era of acting. Simply put, Daniel Day-Lewis, the man, is not. Yes! Tanya Roberts. Another model turned actress. They should really learn that that jump isn't as easy as it sounds. They go off, both faults move at once. Tanya Roberts started off her career auspicious as she was chosen from 2,000 candidates to replace Shelley Hack in the fifth season of Charlie's Angels. Unfortunately for her, the show just didn't work anymore and it was cancelled after that. And that's pretty much how Robert's career went from there. She starred in such highbrow content as The Beastmaster and Sheena Queen of the Jungle, for which she was nominated for a Razzie and had her performance critiqued as quote, a staring comic book opaqueness in The New Yorker, ouch. Roberts then became the most forgettable Bond girl ever in A View to Kill, a film that cemented her legacy as one of the worst actors of the decade. Patrick Swayze. She's like the wind. Now Swayze certainly has a very specific acting type, maybe overly earnest, serious even in ridiculous situations, and when it works, like in Dirty Dancing. Patrick Swayze is simply fantastic, but it's those times when something is just a bit off that his persona becomes a bit unbearable, and Swayze then becomes much harder to watch on screen. Case in point, he was nominated for the worst actor Razzie for two films in the same year, 1989, Roadhouse and Next of Kin, two middling movies that Swayze helps out, well, not that much. Okay, okay, I also do kind of love Roadhouse, but I'm not sure Patrick is acting great in it. When the film around him doesn't soar, he tends to be wooden, with a one-note delivery that can be painful to watch. Hey, at least he is gorgeous. Keanu Reeves. Excellent! And finally, we have someone who makes this list, not because he was a terrible actor in the 1980s, but because he was almost too good. Whoa! And unfortunately, this informed the rest of his career, because Keanu Reeves only had the lead in one massive 80s film, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And yeah, he was really fantastic in it. The guy just perfectly nailed a Southern California stoner perfect mannerisms. He was a caricature, a cartoon, and it so worked. And then he <laughs> kept doing it, forever. It's almost impossible to watch any of Reeves' later films, from The Matrix, to Point Break, to even The Lake House, and not see Ted Theodore Logan creep in a little bit. Maybe he was just playing himself, Maybe he sucks at acting and just got cast in the perfect role, but Keanu hasn't stopped being excellent since. Whew, okay, throw the rocks now, because those are the 20 worst actors from the 1980s. So, who did we do disservice to? Are there any crappy actors that we missed? Well, please get in the comments and tell us who shouldn't have been on this list and who should have. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up icon, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a memory. But most importantly, from all of us here at Do You Remember, we want to thank you very much for watching.